Hi, everybody. It's Mary Rowe from the Canadian Urban Institute welcoming you to yet another jam-packed session of City Talk, this time about the future of downtowns and how can we go about restoring the core. Um, we host these things in various parts of the country. Last week, we were in Halifax for the week doing a CUI local. And Panita will remember we were in, that's right, Paul, we saw you a few times. Panita will remember we were in Edmonton uh, doing the same kind of a process a number of months ago. Um, we're coming west to your neighborhood, uh, Nolan, in a couple of uh, weeks. We're going to be in Vancouver and in Victoria in October. And uh, I just always reinforce that we're in the connective tissue business, folks. We're trying to make uh, the case for what urban environments in Canada were 80% of the population, 80 plus percent of the population live, and where the economy and social innovation, all things are driven from uh, in this country. And so what does that mean for us? What does that mean for policymakers? What does it mean for investors? What does it mean for people living in their communities and how we design them, manage them, and, and uh, hopefully thrive in them? And the pandemic has been an extraordinary moment for us to rethink urban environments and figure out how do we do it better? How do we do it differently? And uh, this Restore the Core work is all about folks Focusing, training our attention to a very specific, unique component of urban Canada, which is the downtowns, the central business districts, and it stems from a lot of our work looking at main streets. So a lot of these folks that are here joining us have been in the trenches doing this and watching it and working it in their local communities. Uh, uh, and we're just delighted to have them. Uh, Mark Garner was involved at the ground, the very beginning of this initiative. Um, and so we're delighted to have all of you and Paul, who also was, you all were. And they've been very patient as we've been trying to push, push, push to figure out what needs to change. Um, I'm just going to encourage people to plug into the chat where you're coming from. As you know, we broadcast these live and then we repurpose them and send them out and send them out and send them out. And they get they do get watched. There are lots of Canadians and Americans who lie in bed at night and watch a city talk. What? Go figure. Or they show it to their class or they show it to colleagues. And so I'm encouraging people to do that, to always go in. We have a hundred of these darn things. And there are so many people on them that have been so smart, said such smart things. And they have a lot of... Uh, lasting time, you know, you continue to learn as you watch again and you think again and that none of these, uh, as we always say, the conversation doesn't end here, it just begins. And so we encourage you to do that. And similarly, when you identify yourself in the chat, tell us where you're coming from and also just know that everything you put in the chat stays in the chat and we publish that too. It's because lots of people put great ideas and solutions and before you know it, there's a parallel universe over there uh, coming up with all sorts of important things. So remember on Zoom that we you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Um, we do have closed captioning. If it's driving you nuts and you don't want to see that little ticker tape thing, go to the bottom of your screen. You can disable it. Um, and we just encourage people to put, as I suggested, questions in the chat, and uh, we'll try to get to them on the program. Um, as I said, Toronto is a national entity. Uh, work at Toronto. CUI is a national entity. Every Canadian just shuddered when I said that, misstead that, that Toronto was a national entity. We happen to be headquartered in Toronto historically, but we have colleagues, including my beloved colleague in the planning department, Jen Parrott, who's in Ottawa, having moved from Regina. And so we continue to uh, foster and build connections across the country. But here I am located today in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples are now home to many, many diverse First Nations and Inuit and Métis people. Tomorrow will be our first National Day of Reconciliation and recognizing the impact of residential schools across this country and other forms of abuse and discrimination that continue to affect the legacy of how we've built our communities in Canada and how we've built our society in Canada. So tomorrow CUI will close. Um, we are uh, dedicating ourselves to some kind of active observance in the communities in which we work and live to acknowledge this, to continue the journey of understanding what reconciliation really involves and what truth really involves. And I'm delighted to have Nolan on this call because Nolan has come from New Orleans where he and I actually crossed paths post Katrina. And he has some experience of other kinds of uh, approaches to reconciliation across race and culture. And uh, so I'm very appreciative that today is that is the beginning of that process, not the end. Uh, and tomorrow we will acknowledge that. And, and so as I was suggesting, Toronto also home to Mississaugas with credit um, and uh, Treaty 13 and the Williams Treaties. And the it was interesting being in the East with you, Paul, and hearing how in Halifax, 
the uh, indigenous connections are acknowledged and in terms of unceded territories and what the legacy of that is and how you're in fact in that community uh, with the Mi'kmaq uh, trying to figure out how do you embrace that and how do you actually, how do we move forward together in ways that are just and, uh, and reflective of the commitment this country has made to uh, uh, reconciliation with uh, indigenous peoples. So we uh, provocatively called this session, are we talking about a revolution? I talked to the Globe and Mail this week. He was a, uh, with Alex from the Globe and Mail. He's a person not as old as me, but of a certain generation who got a kick out of that name. But uh, we know that anybody under 50 maybe doesn't really get talking about a revolution, but those of us of a certain age uh, appreciate, is this our 60s moment for really re-identifying, reimagining what our urban environments and particularly our downtowns need to look like. And so this report that Jen anchored with many, many, many contributors, including all the folks on this call and underwriters and inputters, and um, uh, she's gonna take you through it and just give you kind of highlights about what we're saying when we say, how do we make the case for the core? Remembering that a lot, I mean, I'm sure you guys will corroborate this with me. There are a lot of people across the country that sort of think, oh, really, really? Um, I have an anecdote about this, which is <laughs> when I was in Halifax last week, I uh, invited an old, old friend of mine who uh, uh, lives in Dartmouth, which is across the river, part of the regional municipality of Halifax. And uh, now she's of advanced years and she's lived there all her life. And I said, would you like to have lunch on Saturday? And uh, I said, I'm going to be over here in Halifax, this neighbor. She said, oh, she said, I haven't come to Halifax uh, during COVID. People that know HRM know that we're talking about a, uh, a driving across a bridge. So downtown is not necessary, and Dartmouth has its own downtown, which complicates things. So I guess that's part of the question back to you, Jen, is how are we going to define downtowns? Um, and what, do, what are they going to evolve and look like? So I'm looking forward to hearing what Mark and Panita and Paul and Nolan will say after you just get us started in terms of what uh, you learned and why you think we need to be provoked to think about making the case for the course. So over to you, welcome to Jen, who's in Ottawa at this very moment, fresh back from Halifax. Can everyone see my screen? Tech is working. All set? All right. You look good. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today to give you a short overview of the case for the core report, which will provide the background and the, the substance for our conversation today. So as Mary mentioned, the case for the core report comes out of two initiatives of CUI, Bring Back Main Street and Restore the Core, both initiatives which are aiming to create healthy, vibrant, and inclusive main streets and downtown. And these initiatives bring together stakeholders and decision makers, are part of a national campaign and a national narrative and are really aiming to evaluate possible incomes, uh, uh, possible impacts and inform outcomes. So the work for the case for the core report was started earlier this year to evaluate the specific challenges and needs of downtowns and central business districts in Canada's eight largest cities, which will act as kind of um, perspectives, which can be of course expanded across Canada's other main streets and downtowns. So at this point in the pandemic, it's obvious that main streets and downtown cores have been hit hard by COVID and that bold action is needed. And that's really the basis for the case for the core report. We know our main streets to be symbols of urban life, providing essential and non-essential services to individuals, residents, and the home to many local businesses. And Canada's downtowns are providing a core identity to our cities. Um, they are the economic engine, they're the places that attract workers, residents, and visitors and also home to our educational and other uh, institutions. To give you a, a sense of the importance of downtown, as noted in the report, average, on average, downtowns make up just two tenths of a percent of the land area of their metro area, but they provide a home to approximately 4% of the residential population. They're home of 17% of jobs and 15% of their local GDP. Perhaps even more significant is that when we look at the combined outcome of the eight cities that are profiled in the report, they provide 55% of Canada's overall GDP. And the impacts of COVID to downtowns and mainstream supports are prevalent um, if you spend time in these areas. So we see a decrease in office workers, a decrease in public transit use and footfall, resulting in fewer customers and inactive streets and streetscapes. 
Downtowns that have emptied during the day and night are also gutting the hospitality industry. And this decline in industry, of course, is um, in contrast to the challenges of providing and continuing to provide safe services to our vulnerable populations throughout the pandemic. So with these combined factors, Canada's downtowns in many ways have become these places of great contrast and areas of high anxiety or uncertain futures. So the report aimed to answer several questions. What are the core functions of our downtown? And the report outlines nine functions of the downtown. What trends have impacted the downtown during COVID? What are the possible scenarios or implications from our down, for, for our downtowns based on COVID and future recovery? And what bold ideas can we take away from our current learning and experiences to transform our downtowns? And throughout this work, several issues became apparent. So downtowns throughout Canada and internationally are on different trajectories. That is some towards decreasing affordability and diversity, but others towards abandonment or neglect. We realized through this work that restoring the core as it is or as it was isn't the best or only option, that this is really an opportunity to rethink our downtowns. And the case for the core report really aims to provoke new questions and to rethink our downtowns for a different outcome for recovery. Using the methodology of strategic foresight, the case for the core report evaluates and imagines some possible outcomes for our downtowns. And I'll take you through the three scenarios that are envisioned in the report. Scenario one, titled When the Lights Go Out, imagines a downtown which includes continuous exodus, so businesses and residents continue to leave the, the core of the city. And this results in disinvestment from the public and private sectors. We see an increase in commercial vacancies, resulting in both living wage and low wage jobs leaving the core. Retail and service industries, of course, struggle to survive and either close or move to other parts of the city. Vehicles dominate in terms of mobility. Social service demand continues to increase, but organizations struggle to provide the services needed. And there is a perception of downtown as being unsafe. Scenario two is a continuation of where many cities were on, uh, the direction many cities were going prior to COVID. So this we've titled, nothing's going to change our world, really a continuation of the status quo. And this resulting in greater inequalities, unaffordability or lack of flexibility or innovation. So increasing housing prices, causing displacement or homelessness, a flexible work model that is now embraced but creates inconsistent activity downtown um, which makes it difficult for businesses to stay. Precarious situations for many resulting, such as uh, essential workers or creatives who now need to leave further from the core and perhaps are either struggling with longer commute times or um, inconsistent work and employment. And a greater unrest and a lack of flexible and policy solutions resulting in a lack of change uh, and innovative solutions at a time when it's needed most. Scenario three is the desirable scenario. Uh, and this is where we come to talking about a revolution. So this is a scenario in which we re-envision or reimagine our downtowns as diverse, inclusive, and vibrant. This might include the adaptive reuse of commercial buildings to create more affordable or housing or more diversity of housing types. Underutilized ground floor spaces could be transformed into active uses that animate our streetscapes. Active transportation and public realm investments increase, creating more movement and mobility on the street. Um, infrastructure uh, is, is enhanced, um, including uh, serving those who it needed most. New models of community policing are established, creating a greater social support system and social cohesion is restored. So this including social justice, reconciliation and restorative justice which is not only present in the activities in our downtown, but also in the way that we name and use our public spaces and our streets. So the goal of the next round of work coming out of the Restore the Core report is to really focus on the choices we make today in order to enhance and change our futures for downtowns and main streets. So this means evaluating the decisions uh, we make to create equitable, vibrant, flexible, livable, and resilient communities. And using the case for the core report, CUI will work next to workshop scenarios in the report in cities throughout Canada. So we spent some time in Halifax last week workshopping the ideas in the report to create context sensitive responses that could help to shape this recovery. 
We hope to share ideas and lessons nationally and beyond using the platforms we have, including City Talk, our Bring Back Main Street initiative, our Restore the Core initiative, and other collaborative and partnership uh, projects and to really be able to test different solutions on the ground. So not only talking about the recovery and the ideas behind the report, but really helping to enact them on the ground. And finally, to engage governments to be a part of the solution. I'll now turn it over to Mary and the panelists to lead the discussion on uh, possible outcomes for recoveries of our downtowns and main streets. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jen. Um Again, I think this is a, you know, in, the, in March of this year, we had a big thing with people. We had a number of people from around in Europe and in the U.S. talking about what was happening in downtowns. Um, it was a kind of Mel Gibson-like dystopia happening in a lot of places. And uh, some of those people continue to advise us. And we heard both from Richard Florida and Bruce Katz earlier in the week when we sent them advanced drafts. They're continuing to reinforce that this is a discussion that needs to happen. You know, I have an, my own little anxiety here which is that people are so fed up with the level of inconvenience and stress and uncertainty that they've had to live with that they just want it all to go away and they think it's all gonna be fine and we're gonna go, they just want things back to normal. And there are, I think, even people who will walk along a street, for instance, a main street, see that there are a lot of people and think, oh yeah, well, we're good. You know, I. I'm interested to hear from you folks, whether you think we're good. And Panita, I'm gonna to go to you first because uh, Alberta is in the throes of a, a, a very intense experience of COVID in a way that is, I'm sure, just unbelievably stressful and disheartening for all of you. And so th you're not anywhere near post COVID. And, and, and I wanna get a sense from you, uh, but you're also in jurisdictions where you're downtowns in Alberta have been struggling for a bit longer because the economy started to uh, transition a number of years ago. So you've been in this kind of shock reimagining mode perhaps longer than some of our colleagues have. And so you got the jump on us. So I, can you just talk to us a little bit about what your perspective is about this focus and, and what you're seeing and, and what you think needs to be the way in which we're gonna get people's attention about why we need to make a case for the course. So I'm gonna to go to you first, Panita in Edmonton. Yeah, thank you so much, Mary, and thanks for that summary, Jennifer. This is such a such an important report. Um, you know, Calgary and Alberta in particular has really sort of been this this case study, this cautionary tale about a downtown that is you know super reliant on on one particular industry in their case um, that is hyper reliant on a on a very sort of corporate office uh, traditional central business district. Um, but yeah, you're right. Like Edmonton hasn't been that far behind and our, our office vacancy rate um, is now creeping somewhere around 20%, which is a pretty key indicator for us because our residential base is not huge. And that is one thing that also sets us apart from uh, some of our peers. So it's we're very fortunate that we're actually in the middle of a municipal election right now in Edmonton. It's October 18th. And we've been able to have our downtown truly be at the forefront and the center of the conversation about this election, which has been really helpful because it helps us um, cement this as a priority for the entire city. Um, everyone is talking about what happens when a downtown you know, ceases to be vibrant, ceases to be attractive, ceases to um, encourage you know, businesses to locate here and residents to want to wanna live here. Um, some of that is helpful, again, pointing to Calgary and looking at their tax shift, like, you know, really having their tax base, $250 million in three years, um, get shifted to, to neighborhoods outside of the downtown. So, uh, we're doing everything we can to prioritize this conversation with all of our candidates for mayor and, uh, and for council and, and this COVID situation that Alberta is in is devastating because we were just creeping back to some form of normal. Um, you know, things were feeling okay. And now we're under another mandatory work from home order. Uh, and just the uncertainty at this point is, is absolutely devastating. So I think it's safe to say that, that we're all holding our breath a little bit right now. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a, you must feel like you're in this stop start, hey? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I can't even, the number of conversations I've had with businesses who rely on office worker traffic on residents who, you know, felt like, oh, people are back. I feel safe again. And then now we're right back to where we were. Like it just, yeah, it's, it's the whiplash. It's the, the, like the, the constant low grade stressor that's just there that is grading on everyone's um, state of mind and mental health. And um, you can't plan, you can't plan for your business. You can't plan for your life. You can't say definitively as a downtown resident, I'm going to stay downtown um, because it feels like everything is stacked up against you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is, as you say, it's a, uh, it just sort of um, makes any kind of remediation almost impossible for you at the moment. You've got to still get them into cope mode, right? Yeah. Um, I know that Ottawa, the city of Ottawa, has a, a similar experience because the government of Canada is not coming back. So they haven't had this, they have not had the experience of the fourth wave quite acutely, as acutely as you're having it. But they have a, two major employers, the um, office worker uh, sector that's in, employed by the government of Canada and the tech sector, none of which is coming back into their offices. And so what, you know? And, and what's going to happen to their central business district. Okay, let's go to you, Nolan, if we can, um, and, and hear from your perspective. You're a newcomer to Vancouver. Um, you have a history there of uh, downtown having, uh, I would say, um, a kind of visceral experience of the conflicting uses of downtowns because the downtown east side is right in downtown. And you have a, a large population, a vulnerable population that um, exists uh, and, and it co you coexist. And uh, now we have a contaminated drug supply. We have opioid deaths, outnumbering COVID deaths along the West Coast. And so I'm assuming that that is going to inform your recovery strategies for your downtown or downtowns. So uh, welcome to Canada, Nolan, and welcome to your gig in Vancouver. And we're keen, keen, keen uh, to hear from you what you're seeing and what you, why you think restoring the core is an important conversation that we need to have. Sure, and, and thank you for having me. It's um, it, it's quite interesting the similarities that you wouldn't imagine between a place like New Orleans and a place like Vancouver. They're both uh, surrounded by water, but after that, you would think uh, that's where the similarities would end. Uh, in in New Orleans, Mary, you'll recall uh, Charity Hospital closed after Hurricane Katrina, and Charity Hospital was the public hospital. Uh, where everyone uh, who needed mental health services was treated. Uh, and because that hospital closed, we saw a, an uptick in homelessness, an uptick in distressed people uh, in, in the community. And because of the climate of New Orleans, we also saw uh, an increase of people, even after Hurricane Katrina gravitating towards uh, a city where they could exist year round and in relative comfort. Uh, and so in, in Vancouver, we were seeing something similar. They, the Riverview Hospital, which closed a number of years ago, uh, has contributed to uh, the increase in distress that we see on the streets. Uh, the temperate climate and the same uh, desirability that the tech industry and other industries have for Vancouver that I and my family have for Vancouver is uh, the same reason anyone would, would want to be here. Uh, people on the streets who are a very mobile population want to be here. Um, and so the, the strategy as I understood it uh, was a four pillar strategy here in Vancouver. It was uh, treatment, uh, enforcement, education and harm reduction. And we've done a really good job of harm reduction but haven't done a really good job of treatment, of enforcement uh, and of education. And when I think about what the recovery will look like for downtown Vancouver, I think about uh, getting back to sort of the traditional things that we would do in downtown management, activations, making sure the place is clean, economic development, making sure we have a vibrant retail corridor, but often first and foremost, it's public safety. And I know coming from a place like New Orleans, and it, it doesn't help to repeat this over and over again, that downtown Vancouver is probably one of the safest places in North America. It's one of the safest downtowns uh, you could find. It certainly doesn't have the issues that I had when I worked for the downtown development district in New Orleans, where we had, uh, during my time there, during my four years there, we had six people shot at the same bus stop. Uh, so we, we, it certainly doesn't have those issues. 
But when you walk down Granville Street and it's not as populated by office workers as it once was, but you see people who are harming themselves, that makes you feel unsafe. And so I, I understand uh, the liberalization policies and, and the reason why we would have that approach to, to drug use. But if you're not leaning into treatment, if you're not providing true supportive housing to people when you house them and instead you're just buying old hotels and converting them into SROs, uh, you're creating an environment where people feel unsafe because you feel unsafe when you walk past people who are actively harming themselves in the street. Um, and so that is, that is issue number one. How do we provide um, the other three forms of, of that pillar? The harm reduction strategy seems to be an appropriate one, but how do we figure out how to do uh, meaningful enforcement that puts people on the path to transition? How do we give people the right uh, treatment and how do we do education? That, that social part of, uh, of downtown management, that social service part, is going to be critical as we think about what it looks like in the future. Thanks, Nolan. Um, it's interesting, you know, I uh, 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 yesterday had a good conversation with Tim Tompkins, who many of you know, and I know he was talking to Mark today, former director of the Times Square Alliance in New York City. And we were talking about, and Paul, this will be something that will be um, ties right in with what we were doing with you last week, that the role of the business improvement district or the downtown development organizations that exist, the kinds of infrastructure that we've created for 50, 60, 80 years in North American cities, um, in fact, has to morph now. It has to become something quite different than it maybe once was. And uh, when we were in Halifax with Paul, um, we saw his uh, organization employs navigators, which are people that are actually working with uh, populations that have mental health challenges are not securely housed or for whatever set of interesting, whatever set of complicated reasons are not being uh, provided the support they need in the system and they end up in downtown environments. And so I might actually go to you next, Paul, about that, about the kinds of interventions that we need to be thinking about and the kinds of supports and who should be providing them to really make these downtowns continue to be vibrant. And then Mark, after you finish swigging your water, I want to I want to follow up with something Nolan just said about hospitals, because I know that Young Street uh, has become, the spine of Toronto has become a kind of lightning rod for health, the, the breakdown of healthcare supports uh, in the downtown. And what does that look like? And what do you, because we know that downtowns are going to continue. I hope they will continue to have hospitals located in downtowns. I think it's a problem if they don't, but at the same time, it it creates these kinds of conflicts around users and support, some of what Nolan just got, got at. So first to you, Paul, to talk a little bit about how do we equip ourselves? What are the, what are the kinds of ways we need to organize uh, to provide this kind of nurturing of a downtown? And then to you, Mark, to talk a little bit about what you're seeing on Young Street. Go ahead, Paul. Thanks, Mary, and, and hello, everyone. Uh, welcome from Halifax, uh, or Chibuktuk, as uh, as the Mi'kmaq people called it, uh, and and that means Big Harbor. And I just got a text from someone, a Haladonian, which is what we call ourselves for whatever reason, um, uh, texted me to say, did Mary say that you crossed the river to come from Dartmouth to Halifax? And I'd be remiss if I didn't say, no, you crossed the harbor, second largest ice-free Thank harbor. You. So, there we Thank go. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your viewers happy, me. But No, no, and I appreciate that I make these mistakes. I referred to the Bird Inlet last night when I was talking to Nolan City Council. I completely buggered up that one too. So thank you for the correction. I always appreciate being corrected. Not the river, a big body of water, AKA the harbor between Halifax and Dartmouth, all part of HRM. That's right, all part of the, I think it's the second largest city in, in uh, Canada. Anyway, uh, yeah, these, these are, are great questions. And we were, um, We've been we've been going through this uh, this process. We had the you know the, the folks from from CUI this whole CUI local. We hosted the Art of City Building Conference. You know amazing conversations we had uh, last week, um, and and really we're trying to get beyond some of the sound bites. So we're in the midst of of doing this new economic strategy, and so we're all talking about inclusive economic growth, which is kind of a new buzzword, uh, an important one, and, and and making inclusive places is something that downtown organizations like ourselves have always been about. You know we always like say we like to have places that that are welcoming uh, for everyone that they're they're barrier 
free and, and everyone you know can go there and find a place um but then when you look at it from the actual you know an actual example and i'll use one that, that some people may know so we have a a park that, that's in our in our downtown kind of in the southern part of our downtown uh, it used to be called cornwallis park uh, it was norm uh, named for the founder of halifax uh, a british governor who uh, who was really kind of a horrible person um and so we decided through a great process actually i thought a, a really good process uh, to remove the statue rename the park it's now called peace and friendship park uh, to honor the peace and friendship treaties um and so that park really became a bit of a hotbed uh, very recently because it's had some investment. There's a brand new playground there, which, which brings families down. There's high-end shopping adjacent to the park. There's a beautiful historic hotel that's right there. Um, and as we're seeing these homeless encampments crop up across across uh, you know all of our downtowns, uh, there was one uh, that cropped up in, in that area. And so you it had an interesting uh, situation where you, you kind of had an inclusive place. You had everyone you know in that park. You had families with kids. You had homeless people. You had high-end retail shoppers. You had tourists uh, that were starting to come back. Um, and anyway, and, and as some of you may have seen from, from national headlines and, and pictures, uh, that didn't work at all um, uh, to the point where actually the police went in, forcibly uh, removed people from the park. Uh, this went south very quickly. Protesters showed up. Pepper spray was employed, um, basically kind of a version of what happened in, in Toronto. So this is a black mark for Halifax um, um, and uh, and really was an example of, of, you know, it's these are difficult and challenging issues. That's, that's an example of where all the challenges of downtown are kind of manifest in one particular area. Um, and and we had this goal of, of creating an inclusive park. We kind of did it, but then we kind of really blew it. Uh, and so we can't just say, hey, let's have an inclusive park. You know, we, we've really got to dive deep into these issues. And an example where all these issues, including the ones in the recent federal election and our own recent provincial election, all the key issues are downtown issues, you know, whether it's housing or whether it's reconciliation, whether it's handguns, whatever it is. Um, even though we, we haven't been talking much about downtowns, I didn't think we did it at the federal election. Uh, we didn't much at the provincial in our recent provincial election. Um, you know, but these are all downtown issues. So we've got to insert ourselves in the process. That's all a long way to say this is all very complicated. Um, as Mary said, we do have a navigator program. Uh, that's essentially an individual. He's a social worker. You know, he's funded by the business community. Um, he works for the business community. Uh, but his main role is to engage with the, with street involved individuals uh, to try to direct them into into services or housing or employment or or even just to check on them to make sure they're they're doing okay on a daily basis. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention was was lack of coordination. Um, the, the eviction of the encampments happened while our navigator was away for two weeks because he was getting married. And so there was just a complete breakdown of communication. It was, it'll be a good test case about, you know, of how, of how not to deal with, uh, with homeless encampments, I would say. Um, but that's not to say that, that our city doesn't have great intentions and our city is trying, is struggling with how to deal with things like housing, because in Nova Scotia, housing is not a municipal responsibility. Um, social services are not a municipal responsibility. They're, they're a provincial one. And so I think it's a great example. Um, of how we need to kind of break down some of these barriers. We need some some big top-down approaches. We need to, we need a national downtown summit. We'll talk more about that, I'm sure, later today. But we need to kind of break down some of these silos uh, and and have government talking with business commissions and other community groups to figure out how do we how do we kind of share the responsibility and work together on some of these issues because they're they're not easy. There's no easy solutions for most of these things. I like the idea of a national downtown summit. I think just trying to focus. You know, it's so hard in Canada. I don't want to. I don't want to people to feel sorry for us but it, and Nolan I just want to say that uh, nobody's going to you're not going to befriend anybody in Canada if you talk about how Canadian cities are not as bad as American cities honestly this will not these will not endear you to your Canadian new your new Canadian neighbors to be compared to the US you may have picked that up that vibe but the the thing is we're a vast geography with a fairly small population and we don't actually have a network as, of as many large cities as as probably our economy would benefit from having the way the US does, the way Europe does, the way Asia does. So it does make it difficult, I think, to, is anybody else noticing that? We, we're not as quick at learning as I think we'd like to. So we, we can see in several cities, not just on this call, but in our CUI constituency, several cities that have not handled encampments well. We have not been learning from each other about this approach doesn't work, that approach it would be better. And so I'm, I keep hoping that through this pandemic and through the different channels and networks that we've been establishing together through uh, uh, City Talk and City Share and City Watch and all the different platforms that we're all creating and the, the Bring Back Main Street stuff and the International Downtown Association, that we're trying to elevate our learning so that we 
if one city screws it up, another city can say, well, we're not going to do it that way. You know what I mean? Like it's a, so, and even for people to realize that I don't think most people realize that business improvement areas and districts have social workers on their, on their staff. I do not think people get this. And I'm wondering if this is part of the uh, awareness that COVID is going to have brought to regular folk that these kinds of, we need holistic supportive services that if we want to have a city that includes everyone, if we don't, if we want to have a place, if we want to have places where everyone can feel it's part of their home. So Mark, I'm going to go to you next and just talk, if you can, about the particular experience of Young Street and being uh, the head of a BIA of, a, of really of the, the commercial and financial center of the country in many ways. So give us your perspective and, and why you think we need to care about restoring the core. Well, uh, again, thanks for CUI putting this discussion on and thanks for all the additional panelists. Uh, Mary, I would say the point you just talked about, uh, specifically around education, is key. Sometimes a lot of these discussions that we have are all the people that are in this game and doing this gig every day. So you're preaching to the converted. Uh, I looked at the panelists, you know, and their expertise, but I also look at the attendants that are here today. And I want to give a shout out because there's other core BIAs that are here today yep, on the yep. session. Uh, there's members from BIAs here. Uh, there's other municipalities. And I want to do a quick shout out to Deb Chapman, who's a councillor from Kitchener. We've got to also look at the, you know, the tiered cities, right? Not just the big economic drivers, but the smaller second tier and third tier. Uh, but also uh, present today is some of the consulates that are directly engaged because they've got problems that they're having in Europe and best practices that are going on there. Uh, I think everything, I'm gonna echo all the statements that everybody has said today in regards to uh, the issues, uh, you know, as Nolan had mentioned, the four pillar model, you know, on downtown Young, let me tell you, we have ticked the harm reduction box 17 times, but we haven't ticked any of the other boxes around treatment, education and enforcement. Uh, I think there's a bigger role for CUI and all the work that we do is to educate the community on the reality of the situations of our downtowns. We, again, have been very good during this pandemic on dealing with the harm reduction and making sure that people that are the most vulnerable in our communities have housing. But I would question as part of this report, and if you haven't read the, uh, everybody that's on the call today, the nine functions of downtowns, and obviously, health and safety is component. It's more than just a hospital. It's more than just public health issues. You need supportive housing. You need detox. You need supervised consumption sites. It needs to take a more holistic approach. And, and Young Street has been during this pandemic, and it was started before the pandemic when we opened our uh, first uh, injection site, uh, we started to see a transition of the neighborhood and those services have mushroomed into something bigger for us. And I would encourage that during this pandemic, a lot of the, the individuals that we're dealing with and the most vulnerable are not from our city. So we need the supports to be in North Bay because same conversation that you had, Mary, about, you know, between Dartmouth and Halifax, people that live in rural communities in, in North Bay won't even drive downtown because they don't feel safe anymore because of the concentration of services. So we really, you know, what we've experienced and what we need to be advocating for is obviously a decentralized strategy that when we look at these new uh, neighborhoods that we're gonna live in, that it's inclusive of everybody. Uh, right now there's an overburden. So we need to decentralize because we've created these social inequities that need to be addressed. It's very complicated, and our BIA is doing extensive work, as you know, in regards to developing programs. We're now uh, helping with educational and training of other BIAs, other member businesses, and we're continuing now just based on how we're addressing, uh, you know, de-escalation strategies within the public realm. We're now consulting in New York, Philadelphia, Seattle, San Francisco, Indianapolis, all looking for solutions that we can all share together. And that's the power of this network. But if you're not waking up every morning and doing good work to change the neighborhood that you live in, then you need to start doing it because all those other people that just want to come back and work and go back to the way it was, it's not going to happen anytime soon. You heard it here first. Well, you know, um, I live in a neighborhood that has a safe injection site and uh, not down, not downtown, not right downtown. And, uh, uh, I'm interested in how we're going to, as a society, 
recommit ourselves to living in diverse in a diverse environment where there's room for all sorts of folks and that the services are there and so i worry a little bit mark when we say decentralized that that to me is not facing a reality that you're always going to have a concentration of certain kinds of services in downtown areas and i and i'd like to i think of charity hospital nolan which was one of the more poignant uh, tragic stories of, of new orleans that it treated the vulnerable population it was smack downtown it also happened to be a magnificent uh, heritage building and it it became a specialist in lamentably in gunshot wounds as you just identified but it was for the low-income community and it and it was downtown and then one of the decisions that was made was to shutter it and then build a hospital, regional hospital, further away with a suburban floor plate that, that left the downtown community feeling abandoned and the heritage community feeling un unhappy. And I think that, so I guess it's a, it has to be a balance, right? And, and so part of it for me would be, how do we reintroduce more of a mix of population into the downtowns, into our cores, so that they, so that, generally people understand what the downtown is for and jen i want to come to you because uh we are embarking on some some interesting follow-up work about how could you have more diverse populations actually living downtown so do you want to talk a little bit about um what that might look like in terms of repurposing uh commercial space sure yeah, so CUI is doing some work to really start to understand the opportunities for repurposing commercial space, understanding that office vacancies may continue and that the occupancies we've seen prior to COVID may not ever return. And really seeing this as an opportunity to retrofit these buildings to not only create more housing opportunities, but maybe some of those other social support networks and wraparound services that are needed, but also to create housing diversity so that we're not talking about a monoculture of offices and one and two bedroom condos so that we're getting a diversity of housing to serve a diversity of, of users. Um, and really looking at how in the long term we can start to build buildings that are flexible, that allow for the kinds of ventilation and egress and all the things you need um, to be able to serve multiple purposes, not just a, a nine to five office culture. I mean, you guys know the anecdote, I've shared it before, that after 9-11 after in New York City, a decision was made by the city, by the borough planning department, Manhattan Borough Planning Department, that they would change the zoning and encourage 9-11, the lower Manhattan to develop into a much more mixed use. And so they introduced residential, tons of creatives went in there, uh, different kinds of not-for-profits, and now it's a really vibrant mixed neighborhood. And it's the poster child I always use when people predict that that won't work, and then it did. So what do you think the resistance is, guys, to, and guys? to investing differently. So there's a question in the chat from Frank Mealy. Hi, Frank, uh, about or do we have the right financial incentives in place? Do we need, does the federal government, for instance, need to free up some cash? They've provided a small amount of money to um, uh, encourage uh, what Jen just described, office conversions, and so have some, the municipal government of Calgary, for instance, has committed to some money to do that as part of its downtown strategy. Do you think it's about money and could we create some different kinds of financial tools that could be made available that would allow downtowns to morph into something else? Anybody got some suggestions or reactions to that? Yeah, go ahead, Mark, you first. Yeah, I, I think, Mary, it's it's a great point. And when I talk about, it, to your point around, it's about density of services. What we've seen on Young Street as an example, not only are we dealing with Torontonians that live here, but also people that have come from rural communities because this is where the services are. So but, let me, but, let me, but let me just stop you because that's true for everybody, that Paul has yeah. that. Yeah. So all of Nova Scotia is coming. Nolan through. has that. He gets the whole West Coast. Panita has that. All of Northern, not just Northern uh, uh, Edmonton, not Northern Alberta, but she gets Northern Manitoba, Northern Saskatchewan. They all migrate. So right. do we need, I don't think we'll ever stop that, right? So, no, so are you saying, gets, okay, so you want to be funded where, differently. Okay. That's where it gets into the funding model. We have okay. to open up the funding, right? Obviously, the federal government's got the cash. The provinces have the issues and, and the urban environments or the cities have the problems. So we've got to open the, the financial plumbing in a better way. Uh, it's obviously, you know, clients are coming into our community because they can't get services in North Bay. They can't get services in Sudbury. And that's when I talk about a distributed model. It has to be inclusive within community. So funding is a part of it. But I also think the way we've deployed service and the complications around services and the way we get to those at-risk communities is not working and we have to stop we have to build it the way it's going to be effective in the new urban environment 
versus, okay, this is the way we've always done it. Let's get the round peg and put it in the square hole. No, let's build it the way the community needs it. Because as we know, with density of, you know, if I've got a shelter of uh, 280 people within a building, are you telling me all 200 people, 80 people in that building have the same requirement for service? The answer is no. No. So it needs to be smaller. It needs to be down to, you know, 15 units with direct support of housing, with the mental health supports, the addiction supports, the education and all the things that they need with smaller you can't do it in this large model. It's not working because the growth is happening faster than we can get on top of it. So I think we need to extract a couple of things. First of all, can you, and I'm going to come to you next, Panina. What's the triad? The federal government has the cash. Provincial government has the what? Jurisdiction. And, yeah. the, and the city has the problem. And well, city has, always the municipal has the problem. And this is one of the conversations that we always had with Tim Tompkins, and I'm glad because I am meeting him today as well, is that there's another layer of all this governance and bureaucracy, we have the problem. The on street, the business community and the community itself has the second or the fourth layer of all this. Yeah, like we're the, yeah, the, at the bottom of the thing. We're the catch all. Um, you know, we do, we do uh, summaries after this and takeaways and I just wanna make sure that the folks that are working on them and heard your pithy little statements there. And also this idea that we need to pull it into smaller pieces. Can we get it into smaller pieces? A couple of weeks ago, we had Roseanne Haggerty with us to give this the uh, leadership lecture and she talked about named lists for housing, which is a common practice now. But we took us a long time to understand that we have to get it to a level, to a, a ground level, so we can actually see who we're dealing with and 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 get it into bite-sized pieces. Okay, Panita, what were you going to throw in? Uh, I, I started with, are there financial incentives or different kinds of financial arrangements? If you guys want to swing back to that, if possible, go ahead. Yeah, Nina. yeah, I'll swing back to that. But just to pick up what Mark was just saying, one of the most fundamental challenges we've had here is this complete breakdown in that triad. So from the federal government to the provincial government to the municipality, and then us as a downtown. And so we have to have, in order for it to us, our puzzle to, to be complete, every order of government has to agree on our priorities and our needs, and that money has to get into our hands. And right now we have a complete breakdown between our municipal government and our provincial government yeah. and a complete breakdown between our provincial government and the federal government. Yeah. So for us, it's like it's another reason it feels like a losing battle every day. It feels like we have a provincial government who has prioritized the needs of rural Albertans, um, which is fine because there are significant needs there too. But again, we hold 80% of the population here um, between Edmonton and Calgary. And it, and it really feels like our needs are being fundamentally ignored or misunderstood or yeah. you know, ideal I, I, ideologized, whatever the right word is. Yeah, that. I get it. It's, it's um, certainly, yeah, it's been polarized, hasn't it? And, and you're, you know, the dilemma that we know, which CUI hears all the time, is that the way that political representation is organized, there are many, many more seats in provincial and federal, in the provincial legislature, in the federal House of Commons that come from rural environments. That's one piece of it. But the other thing, as you suggest, is there's a narrative in Canada that we're, we need to restitch, that we actually are completely, we're completely interlinked and it can't be either or, it's got to be both and. And uh, how do we make that case to rural, to rural constituencies that they need healthy urban the same way cities need healthy rural, right? Yeah. Uh, but I hear you about the cascading effect, feds to province to municipal and then to you guys on the ground. Paul. Yeah, uh, sorry, oh, quickly on the, on the incentives thing. On the money side, yeah. Yeah, on the money side. So we also, our, our municipality did a, a residential construction grant strictly for the downtown um, to incentivize residential projects to break ground and, and office conversions were part of that. And I think some took it up, but at the end of the day, it is always about the money. And so as long as housing is a, is a private sector game, um, the incentives that need to be in place have to be way, way stronger if we're going to say it has to make financial sense for the private sector. And it, where we're at right now, that, that incentive wasn't enough. Yeah. Either Nolan or Paul, do you want to throw in on money and what we need to see? Money in terms of housing or money just generally? No, just generally. Do we need other kinds of financial incentives to, to I mean, we know in the culture sector, yeah. for instance, they're saying we do. They're saying we need different kinds of interventions and supports for the cultural sector, which has historically drawn a lot of people downtown. 
Yeah, right. two things I'll say quickly. I think one is, as I agree with Panita in terms of that that structural piece. So during the pandemic, and again, governments had to work differently. Uh, and uh, you know, for years we've tried to work with our local regional development uh, authority, uh, which here is called ACOA, trying to get them interested in programs downtown. And I mean, for years they just they had no interest uh, in really even talking to us. Suddenly during the pandemic, they called us and said, "Hey, we've got all this money. We've got to spend it. We've got to get it into the hands of businesses. You know, within the next three months, can you help us out?" And we said, well, sure. Uh, and we did. And it was a lot of work. And we hadn't really done that. We hadn't done a whole lot in terms of direct grants to businesses. But suddenly we were in the grant giving game. You know what? And we spent all the money that they gave us. And so we're hoping that structurally we've demonstrated, you know what? We're, we're close to the ground level. We know all the players. We're, you know, we're a trusted ally. And I know one of the themes that Art of City Building was progress moves at the speed of trust, right? Bids have been around for over 50 years. They're a Canadian invention. Uh, yet most people, when I most people, the general public, but even governments and people that should know who we are and what we do, don't. That's partly our fault, I guess, maybe in the way we brand ourselves. But by this point, we should be trusted partners. We should be mm-hmm. a trusted fourth level of governance. And even if the feds don't trust the province, the province doesn't trust the municipality, they all should trust us uh, just based on the track record that we have. So I'm not sure how we get to that, but I think we've opened up some of those doors during the pandemic. So we've got to make sure that we don't lose those connections. The other thing I'll say on uh, quickly on housing is... Um, and we've only had a housing crisis in Halifax, Nova Scotia, really for the past six months. It's, it's kind of brand new for us. Suddenly, we, we've got this huge, this huge problem, and now we're looking at what's Vancouver done, what's Toronto done. Um, one of our colleagues that, that Mark will know well, uh, Kate Jonkis, used to run uh, downtown Seattle, and then lo and behold, she went from that gig to being the Seattle city manager, which is kind of what we all dream of and think that we should be doing. Um, and, you know, and she dealt with housing there, and then she left, and then is now in the private sector, and she's doing all sorts of interesting housing work in Seattle. And you know, her comment was, you know, this is something that government have to work on but government's not going to solve this problem you know you need to have the private sector and you need to have all sorts of different developers and what she's focusing on is not-for-profit developers that are actually attracting private investment because you can make money you know on non-market housing it's just, it may be a lower rate of return than you're going to get somewhere else but mm-hmm. it's not like it's a loser's game so we've got to figure out how do we unlock all those savings and private equ- equity that, that's built up over the pandemic uh, and get people investing in housing just remember, $212 billion sitting in Canadian bank accounts, yeah. apparently. It's a staggering amount. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. So, Nolan, instead of going to you on finances, I'm going to let you know what else is on people's minds, and you can choose what you want to respond to. One is, let's t- let's be like Sweden. Thanks, Lars. And let's see if we can get a, min- a municipal income tax. Um, can we find ways for uh, municipal governments to collect more resources themselves, be held accountable for how they spend them, uh, and maybe disrupt the cascading hierarchy that uh, that Mark summarized. Uh, the other thing is that um, a former mayor of Toronto and a former retired senator is uh, uh, who's in the chat, uh, Art Eggleton, is asking a question about transit. You know, that we see fewer and fewer people on transit and they are using their cars because they feel safer in their car. And so what is the, what's the potential impact of that in terms of how we restore the core? So over to you, Nolan, first. Sure. So I, I'm not in a position in BC to advocate for uh, greater taxation. Uh, that, that would not be uh, the position that I would take. I, I would say that we do need uh, better service. And, and one of the challenges uh, that I have found, uh, we just did an activation on Granville Street of pedestrianization and trying to make the case to the city that city resources would be uh, beneficial and that this would be a good use of Uh, city resources was challenging because the municipal government doesn't collect any sales tax. Uh, We've we've had the same challenge when trying to uh, argue that we should bring in FIFA in 2026 or any other number of large events or small activations. The city doesn't see the direct uh, return on any of that. Uh, And many other major cities, when we're talking about doing festivals, events, activations, uh, the city knows that it'll recoup their value, uh, their investment, uh, because they're going to collect an increase in, in that sales tax. Well, if all you're collecting is, is property tax, you don't. It, it doesn't matter whether the the stores are, are busy or or they're empty at, at some level. Nolan, would you make would would you? I mean, I know you're new to the jurisdiction, and I appreciate your your learning. So you're not going to come out too boldly in any of this stuff yet. But you know, at your council last night, it was talked about whether we should look at new value capture. Should we be looking at nef- new mechanisms for for people whose um, equity, personal equity is increased because of a public investment. Is there some way to harness that capital to be invested in community funds, for instance, that could then improve and be invested in land trusts or different kinds of housing structures in downtowns? Is that something you might put on your radar now that when you get your, once you get your feet under you there in Vancouver? 
Sure, I, I think so, but I, I'm reflective uh, of the work that we did in 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009 at, at Common Good in, in New Orleans, Mary, where we probably first crossed cross path. Uh, and we realized that we had to bring all these diverse people together in New Orleans post-disaster, and we were all going to be coming through here, a post-disaster period of recovery. Uh, to figure out what we could all agree on. And public safety was one of those things that we had to uh, all collectively address. Uh, the other thing was government accountability uh, and transparency. And so I would, I would say that that is probably first and foremost before you start talking about uh, additional revenue for government. Uh, public trust has to be rebuilt. Uh, it, was, it was the most important rebuilding project uh, in the city of New Orleans post Hurricane Katrina. It was restoring public trust, I remember. restoring social capital. It was rebuilding networks. Uh, and we have a municipal election coming up. I, I would think that is uh, going to be a big part of the sentiment leading into the municipal election next year. You know, this uh, is you that public trust. You can have any conversation you want about many different mechanisms uh, for increasing revenue for municipal government, but you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, in the current environment where the, the public doesn't have a lot of trust. In, in well, why don't, why don't we finish this by just having a word from each of you about trust? You know, what do you think the opportunity, I mean, I think that Nolan's correct that people's level of fed upness is extraordinary now. People are throwing gravel at politicians. They are, you know, protesting all sorts of things that polite Canadians wouldn't have anticipated would be protested. I think there's a need for us to reestablish trust. And I'm wondering, what do you think the role of downtown could be? Some of the great experiences that any of us have had have been in some kind of, it's some kind of collective experience that was probably took place and we harnessed ourselves downtown. So trust, Mark, thought on how we can restore trust. Oh, that's a big one, Mary. You know, it, I think it, it came out clear in the report about, you know, we're at a phase of massive rethink and the way we do things. And we have to really look at an opportunity that we've got in front of us to transform. Uh, so there is municipal reform, there's community reform, there's uh, the way we provide service uh, is, is a big challenge. So I think, you know, it really is, people are, again, want to get back to the way things were, and it's going to be a very complicated situation come our municipal election next year on, on this subject, but it's being able to come into a public realm or a space within the downtown and not have the issues or encounter the issues that we're experiencing. I feel safe. It's pushing the experiential, it's those things, just the fundamentals. If there's one thing I've been saying to our team and our board is you got to get back to what's in your control and manage your own stuff before you start doing the bigger things. We're right. back at a refocus. Work at the hyperlocal, remind ourselves why cities matter. Panita, what do you think? Something to build trust. Yeah, I, you know, I come from the world of advertising and branding, so I'm going to put that hat on for sure. a moment. I think a, a big part of this exercise that we're all going through right now is a bit of a branding and storytelling exercise for what a downtown is and who it's for and what it means. Um, and so that's what we're doing here. And part of that is all the, the positive activations that we've all talked about doing, like, you know, inclusive public spaces and, and prioritizing pedestrians and some of those things. But it's also really thinking about, you know, who values the urban experience? Um, what is it that brings all of us together? And it's usually that we are people who um, appreciate our differences. We appreciate diversity. We wanna see an equitable and inclusive community. And so that means working with law enforcement and all levels of government and our business community mm -hmm. and our social agencies, mm -hmm. bring everyone to the table with this shared vision for what a downtown is and means. Mm -hmm. um, and how we can all work together to achieve that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paul. We talked a little bit about this at the Art of City building is, you know, we're becoming more isolated, right? Social media isolates us with people that we don't, we agree with our neighborhoods. We're, we tend to live with people that are the same socioeconomic class, right? We're, we're losing kind of attendance in, in faith communities. We talked about that. So what replaces all that, you know, and really that's a, that, that is a role of the downtown, right? Whether it's the farmer's market or the city square, right? Downtowns yeah. where people gather to protest is where they gather to celebrate. And so maybe we just need to be a bit more intentional about how we do that. Now it's tough to do, of course, during COVID because you can't bring large groups together, but you know, I just, 
think back to conversations we've had, you know, when we're doing a new downtown plan where we have to have heritage advocates sitting beside developers and say, we need to figure out a way to work together. You know, that, that, and in those days, it wasn't about just, you know, making snide comments on Twitter, which I occasionally enjoy doing myself, but really I'm trying to weed myself off of. Uh, it, it's really Break that habit, to, Paul. Break yeah, that we, habit. We got to rebuild that trust, you know, face to face. And I think downtown is, is the best place to do it. So maybe we just need to be more intentional about how do we at least at the very least create those spaces that do bring uh, those different perspectives together. Quick words of closing from both Nolan and Jen. Go ahead, Nolan. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with Paul. Uh, and I, I think we've got to do a really great job of communicating uh, in this environment, especially that the diversity of, of downtown, uh, the inclusiveness of downtown is also about the equity of downtown. It's not just about right. uh, gathering people from uh, different backgrounds, race, cultural, and, and, and a place. It's about giving them a real equity ownership stake in that. Uh, and, and I think that's going to be transformative to our downtowns going forward. This yep. idea of social accelerate, social uh, isolation is just an acceleration. Robert Putman wrote Bowling Alone in 2000. Uh, and so this, this, is, this has been a long time coming, this feeling of social isolation. But downtowns are, are the place that can really reverse that, that trend. You and I remember when uh, New Orleans won the Super Bowl the year after Katrina and everybody was on the street and everybody was downtown, every kind of person. And there was for a moment, a sense of extraordinary collectivity. Jen, last word from you in terms of what, why, how does, how can restoring the core bring back trust? What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I would say as, as many of the panelists have hinted at, it's, um, you know, that downtown is often where it sort of exacerbates the best and the worst of who we are. And I, I think, um, you know, so coming from, having lived in New York City is that, you know, people called the, the public transit system, the great mixer, you know, it was a place where we all came together. And so I think a lot of the comments in the chat about how do we restore trust? How do we get people back on transit? It's really about finding those places in which we, they're convenient for us, but they also help build trust because we're all part of the solution. Um, and we're all interacting in a space and realizing that we rely on many of the same systems, to, mm -hmm. you know, despite our social or economic backgrounds. Well, hats off to all of you who are continuing to work every day, as Mark suggested. You wake up every morning and you say, how do I make my neighborhood a better place? It's important that we have this conversation together. We had a great group on the chat, former senator, former uh, uh, counselor, former mayor, uh, current sitting members in the federal legislature in the House of Commons. Always good to see all of you and lots of folks working in business improvement and business development and economic development. So we are a mighty constituency gang and we need to bring a lot more people under our tent with us. At the end of this broadcast, you're going to see a questionnaire go up, a little quick survey telling us what worked and what didn't. Tomorrow, as I said, Orange Shirt Day, National Day of for Truth, Truth and Reconciliation. I hope you can take some time to be reflective and think about what the implications of that is for you and your work and in the way you live your life and the way you interact with your place. Next week, uh, uh, we're going to continue to promote Main Streets and how Main Streets need to recover. We'll be talking about creating Main Streets and I hope you'll register and you'll see the link in, your tr in the chat. Thanks everybody. Have a great, great rest of the week. Lovely to see you from coast to coast. Panita, hang in there. This too will end, you'll get through it. And we all will continue to our dialogue about how do we restore the core. Thanks, everybody.